Hey guys, this is the most time-sensitive video for Ethereum you're going to be watching anytime in the next couple of months. And I, that's why I'm trying to get it out now. I think it's very important for you to understand what is coming in this network. In it, we're going to discuss some things maybe you didn't know about burn and merge and kind of how things have been working in the past. We're also going to jump to the Bitcoin ETF, all right, the Ethereum ETFs. Sorry, I'm so used to saying Bitcoin. The Ethereum ETFs and the potential that they could have on this over the next 99 days, and also talk about EIP-4844, which no one is talking about, and its profound changes to this network. This is a very important uh, video for you to watch. We'll talk about price targets near the end, too. Compare it on CoinMarketCap, or I'm sorry, CoinGecko, to a couple of other uh, investments that are similar in nature, I think, and that are some other big caps so that you can get an idea of the scale of this network and just the kind of impact that's getting ready to occur. I'm personally going to be adding, I think, at least another 50000 to my Ethereum bags for my long-term hold. Also, uh, including uh, layer, some Layer 2 solutions that are going to benefit from some of the changes with the EIP-4844. Uh, this is going to be a quick one today, I think 15, 20 minutes. It's worth watching, so stick around. Without further ado, let's get started. So... Again, I, I want to start this off with a couple things. I'm not a financial advisor. Read the blurb below. This is entertainment. This is me talking about my thoughts and you doing proper research and asking financial advisors, okay? Always, all videos are that. Please pay attention. Now, it's very important to understand, too, I am a huge advocate for Bitcoin. Bitcoin day, right? So I, I love the Bitcoin network. Let's go back over here. I love the Bitcoin network. I believe there's... So much use case and utility for it. It, by far, is the best uncensorable network on the planet where you can move from money from one part of the country, uh, one country to another at a low cost without having to worry about government interference. It is the freest of all monies. That is a very important concept to understand. It cannot be controlled in ways that centralized cryptocurrencies can, like Ethereum, Solana, and others. So I want to get that disclaimer out there real quick. But as an investment opportunity, and there's this concept of the world computer, I do think Ethereum and Solana and some of these others can hold places for transactional networks, not, not really great stores of value, but transactional networks that are able to accomplish a lot. And I do believe that Ethereum actually does have store of value type properties, which makes it interesting. And that's one of the things we're going to be talking about today. Now, ultrasound money, ultrasound.money. This website is an awesome one. I would I would bookmark that. This it shows a ton of metrics about Ethereum, and you can change the gauges to get an idea of like what it was like before, with if proof of work was still occurring, what the burn looks like, uh, who's burning, what the supply is going to look like years from now based upon different changes in the network. Like there's just a wealth of information. Everything you'd ever want to know analytically about Ethereum is on this site. So highly encourage you to check it out. What we're focusing on right now on this. You can see the burn on the left-hand side in the left chart. It shows that this was implemented, I think it was, yeah, 928 days ago. Now, this was important because this actually made it where when there's congestion or high tra transaction volume on the network, they start to burn existing Ethereum, which helps make it deflationary. And at the same time, it encourages people to, to move transactions off the main layer one solution. Like more recently here, Optimism and Arbitrum, right? Which is important because you want to encourage layer two adoption because you know layer one isn't going to be the one that's the cheapest, right? But you still want layer one to be hold some store of value. I think that's what Vitalik and his team have been thinking about is they're like, okay, we want the layer one to hold value because we want people to still use it as like a final layer of settlement. But we also want to encourage people to use these layer two solutions where fees are cheap and, <clears throat> and they don't have to worry about just getting obliterated. Now, here's the problem. For a long time, fees have not been cheap. For years, they have not been cheap. They've gotten very expensive at the last cycle peak, and they haven't gotten much better. And that's problematic because you have developers and teams that just leave because they're like, we don't want to pay these crazy fees. Here, I'm going to try and adjust my camera. We don't want to pay these crazy fees to this network and have people not want to use it because they're transferring, I don't know, I think a lot of NFTs are stupid, 
but let's just use it as an example. They're they're you know getting their NFTs and they're transferring them around and it's costing them an arm and a leg and it's just not viable and it's not worth it. Um, so something like that becomes very costly or just like airdrops. People love airdrops. A lot of the Solana airdrop talk where they drop currencies down to you and then and they, or, or you can you can take them and get paid yield on them, whatever. A lot of this stuff blew up in people's faces last cycle and I don't encourage it at all. Um, free airdrops are okay. Just make sure you're not getting scammed. But, and I would check out, if you're interested in free airdrops and stuff like that, especially for Solana, I would check out Invest Answers James on YouTube or X. Uh, his team is great about that and their Patreon is wonderful too and it gives you a lot of information on it. But again, these are, th- these are things, I'm digressing a little bit. These are things I'm not focused on, but, but the fees were high, right? The fees were really high and that's problematic. And that's getting better with the IP4844 that we're going to talk about in a second. But you can see how with the, even with the burn, if we look at Ethereum here in this blue line, the white line is proof of work. So proof of work is what I used to do years ago in my warehouse where I would have a ton of video cards all hooked up to a motherboard and they would be processing Ethereum transactions for the network, basically crunching algos to be able to solve blocks, kind of like Bitcoin, but not as efficient and just... Anyway, whatever. We won't go into all those details. But that was what was happening before. After the merge, this little panda up here, that went away. So there is no more proof of work. Really, for proof of work nowadays, I would say the only network that really matters. And proof of work is the better network. I'm not going to go into that. That's Bitcoin stuff. But is really Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the only proof of work network that you should care about, in my opinion. Now... But with proof of work going away roughly like 500 plus days ago after the cycle peak. So keep that in mind because that means that people on the Ethereum network haven't really benefited from what happened then. And what happened is a change from 3.14% roughly inflation rate down to 0.993 since that time. Now that's not, I shouldn't even say since that time, that's including the burn in there too. It's actually lower. It's lower than that. It's it's about negative 0.2. So it's become deflationary since the merge. And I'll show you that in a second. Now this is fascinating because before that, last cycle, before the, you know, the peak, Ethereum was much more inflationary, which can be a drag on price, right? Because you're constantly producing new supply and people are having to gobble that up. And so that can suppress, that makes it to where if demand isn't high enough, it can suppress the price. So something I want you to understand. Now we know in here, the orange line is Bitcoin. And depending upon where you're looking, it's like 1.75% to 1.9 right now. And that can vary a little bit based upon when how quickly blocks get solved. And so the timing can vary a little bit, but it averages out, right? Let's just say 1.8 or something like that. That's the number I commonly use. Now, that gets cut in half. So that'll be like 0.9 point, you know, or 0.9, 0.85 or something after April, which is great because gold is like two and a half to 5%. Official numbers are closer to two, two and a half, but I would say it's closer to 5% because all the paper gold that's suppressed the price and that probably isn't backed by much of anything in regard to real gold. That's a problem you have when you can't authenticate against a network and actually like like a blockchain network that's pseudo-anonymous like Bitcoin or even just something like Ethereum where you can validate, oh, hey, this person does hold all of these. That's one of the great things about blockchain in general, right? You can validate the network and understand who holds what. You can't do that with gold. So again, Bitcoin, way cheap, way lower inflation rate than gold. But Ethereum, negative 2%, maybe it gets to negative, or 0.2%, maybe it gets to negative 1% at the peak of the cycle if there's a lot of congestion. So you have a deflationary asset in Ethereum for the first time in a long time. And I, I just want to switch them. I'm going to take out proof of work here, and I'm going to change the time frame to since the merge. So again, look at this. There's, a, there's Bitcoin. Bitcoin will drop to about half of what it is there. But Ethereum is still negative. So there is some store of value type mechanisms and tokenomics that are in play right now for Ethereum. And that is going to be hugely beneficial for the network. Hugely. So just think about that. Stew on that. Next, Ethereum ETFs. This is also huge. We've got seven ETFs here 
that in the next 99 days are going to see their final deadline. And I think they're going to get approved. Why? We got the Black Rocks, the Fidelities, the Van X, the 21 Shares Arc Fund, the Grayscale, the Invesco and Galaxy, and the Hashtag. Like all the big guys are here again. And everything I'm hearing, they're probably going to get approved. Especially since this network is more controllable. You got to remember, it's centralized. So governments can exhibit more control over this one. So it, Bitcoin, they don't have much choice. That's just going to happen, right? They don't have as much control over it, but they can't stop it. Ethereum, they'll be able to say, oh, well, we need you guys to implement a change. Potentially more government control. Not great for the network, but, but it might hold a place. There's always a place for digital assets where there is government control, right? So just stew on it. And again, they won't be able to exert a lot over a short period of time. So what I'm saying is I believe Ethereum could be a really good investment in the next year, year and a half before we hit the next cycle peak. And I think that this ETF and the deflationary environment are going to help a lot. But not just that. There is more, right? I feel like, I don't know, one of these people that sell you stuff at late at night. Anyway, <laughs> EIP4844, protodank sharding. This is huge. This is supposed to go into effect around March, right? This, March 13th is what it says on here. It might vary a little bit depending upon, you know, timing and just like going through alpha beta, all that stuff. But this will help. It says, is, is, is proposed upgrade to Ethereum protocol meant to reduce fees and increase transaction throughput. It's scheduled to go live on Ethereum mainnet on March 13th. This upgrade will introduce a new transaction type that accepts blobs of data, which is a transitional step towards full dank sharding and will ultimately enable Ethereum to manage the capacity for global transaction networks. This is a big deal. This is very, very cool. So this could actually be an order of magnitude reduction in the fee structure that not just benefits Ethereum, but also helps layer two solutions like Arbitrum and Optimism on the network. So I actually am probably applying at least like another 50 grand this week. I already did 15 today towards Ethereum purchases and probably with like 50, 60% of that going to Ethereum. And I'm going to add to Arbitrum and Optimism as well because I believe this is going to be hugely beneficial to this network. The biggest complaint for Ethereum in the last two years has by far been that fees are too high and that it's making developers and people that are, like I said, trying to trade, you know, NFTs or get airdrops. It's made them just go away. And that will change and I think they'll come back. Now, there is a video I'm going to play in a little bit. I'll probably save that for last because um, it's a little more technical. It's only five minutes long, but it goes into EIP 4844 in a more technical nature. But for some of you guys with a short attention span, we're going to skip that for now. There's another good video. I posted this on X today. <laughs> if you have a short attention span, probably not making it through this one. This one is two and a half hours. It's the bankless crew literally walking through the Ethereum roadmap. Very cool stuff. Um, but again, if you if you got a short attention span, two and a half hours is a lot of time. Now, <clears throat> so let's think about the deflationary environment that's created that could get more deflationary. Let's think about the Ethereum ETFs becoming a really strong narrative. What happened with Bitcoin 90 days before the Bitcoin ETFs went into effect? Very, very, very positive narrative, right? So we could be seeing that again. Now, there'll be the time that we get the approval, which is 99 days from now, and then the time they actually go into effect. I think between now and the approval, that's going to be like the really golden zone, and then maybe a little bit after the approval, and probably just like Bitcoin, before it actually goes live. So we'll see the pump before that, I think. And if I'm right, we could see a large one. Now, I do want to go back. So if we look at Ethereum over the long haul here, when I got in, when I started doing my mining in my warehouse, it was 2017. <clears throat> now, that cycle saw 243x, a lot of money. Now, when you get economies of scale growing larger and the law, law of large numbers, you get reductions in the amount of uh, that you can generate and yield as each cycle passes, right? So this last one, instead of 243x, was more like 53, 54x. I believe this next one could be 32x, which again, is diminishing returns, but still a pretty good number. Now, some of that's already happened. You got to get in when nobody else is interested. That's when I get in, right? Well, some of this I'm getting in later to this one, but whatever. I I bought you know miners when CleanSpark was on you know in the dollar range, and I bought options. So I made a ton of money. 
<clears throat> but you want to get in down here. But also, this is a really safe time. We have confirmed the bottom with authority from a technical level. And then you can see where we grinded for months above this FIB level. And now we're just rocketing higher. And when I say rocketing, I really mean it. This Ethereum has started to climb a lot. <clears throat> and I still think that we could get 38% higher. Just to the next FIB. Now, one important thing to mention here. I think that we could be at 4,000. I think we could be at 3,000 this next week. I think we could be at 4,000 by the month end. Maybe um, at least by March, the end of March, I think that could happen. <coughs> oh, my goodness. Sorry. It's my third take. Losing my voice. So, but, or or April. Whatever. Anyway, my whole point is I think we could capture 40 to 120% returns to this between this 4,000 and 6,300 ish range in the next like three months, maybe more. There's a chance that we could really shoot high and get to the dot 618. I've talked about this before. This is the golden fib level. It's like also the golden retracement zone. It's where you're most likely to take a breather. And so 10,000 is possible guys. And so that's a 258% between now and the ETF approval or shortly afterwards. And I think ultimately, this thing could get anywhere to $20,000 to $30,000, in my opinion, this cycle. So we're looking at a 10x, potentially. Anywhere from like a 7x to a 10x on Ethereum. And that's pretty good when Bitcoin, I only expect, you know, three to four and a half, three to five. So... I just feel like this is a good time to get in, and this thing's going to start screaming. Now, a couple things to note. Bitcoin has an over $1 trillion market cap, and Ethereum has $350 billion, roughly. So Ethereum is about a third the size, which is, again, why I believe it has that, because of the law of large numbers, it has the ability, especially with deflationary ETFs and EIP-4844, the ability to go higher, right? It's it's one third the cap. It's got all these other multipliers behind it too. So that's where I get that, you know, seven to 10 X range, right? Now Solana is much smaller. I'm not going to discount the fact that Solana could outperform this. I own a lot of Solana too. I think like 55, 60 grand or something, a decent amount for an altcoin, right? <clears throat> At least for me. Now this is, this is one seventh the size. It's only 50 billion right now. So I still definitely am holding Solana and not getting rid of that because I think that Solana could 15x potentially this cycle, which would be great. So I'm not I'm not discounting its ability to do that and have some really great numbers too. But there's a huge narrative behind Ethereum, and I think Ethereum could maybe even outperform Solana over the next several months as maybe it steals some of the thunder. So I want to be in on that. And that's why I'm bringing this to you now because I want you guys to think about this you know, consult a financial advisor, do further research, look at tokenomics, look at transactions, think about, do deeper dives into the EIP, you know, do whatever it takes for you to get comfortable with your decisions and what you end up doing. But this is what I'm going to do. So I wanted to get it out there, wanted you guys to understand it. And then also, let me go back to that video. I want to play that real quick for the people. It's only like, I'm speeding it up to 1.25. So it's only like a little over five minutes. Well worth the watch. This guy does a good job explaining it way better than a lot of the technical guys. Here we go. P4844 is the Ethereum improvement proposal that implements proto dank sharding. This upgrade on the Ethereum network could reduce transaction costs on layer twos by an order of magnitude. There will be some big changes to Ethereum as part of this EIP, but it can be hard to understand what upgrades are actually being made without getting lost in all of the technical jargon. By the time you finish this video, you'll understand the motivation behind EIP 4844, the major changes that will be implemented, and how this can reduce gas fees on Ethereum by an order of magnitude. You'll even learn why this upgrade is called proto dank sharding when there's actually no sharding happening at all. The idea of implementing some kind of sharding in Ethereum has been around since 2016, which is a long time in crypto years. Even back then, people were worried about Ethereum's rising transaction fees and its ability, or lack thereof, to scale to 1 billion users. People are throwing around the word sharding a lot, so let's actually define it. In computer science, sharding involves splitting something, usually a database, to be stored across multiple resources or computers. Ethereum can be thought of as a mega computer split across a bunch of smaller computers or 
nodes. But there is a catch. Instead of data and computation being split across all of these nodes, every single node needs to store the entire Ethereum transaction history and execute every single line of code that runs through Ethereum. So every time that new data is stored in an Ethereum transaction, it's actually being stored thousands of times over across all of these nodes. Obviously, this is extremely inefficient, and it makes the cost of storing data on Ethereum much more expensive than it needs to be. One solution that has been used to combat these problems are layer two networks like Arbitrum and Optimism. These networks are built on top of Ethereum, but still hold many of the same security guarantees as Ethereum. In order to have some of these security guarantees, these networks are using storage on the actual Ethereum network. But because storing data on Ethereum is expensive for the reasons that we discussed, over 90% of the total transaction fees on layer twos go to storing data on Ethereum mainnet. Layer two transactions are working right now in the sense that they're much cheaper than layer one or Ethereum transactions, but they're not as cheap as we want them to be. If we use sharding on Ethereum to more efficiently store that data, we can reduce fees by an order of magnitude. The main proposal for sharding on Ethereum is called Dank Sharding, which is named after the author Dankrad Feist. In order to shift data storage on Ethereum to sharding, a lot of complicated upgrades would need to be made. Doing a lot of complicated upgrades at the same time increases the chances that something will break. That's where EIP 4844 and Proto Dank Sharding come in. Proto Dank Sharding, which is named after its author, Proto, implements a lot of the changes that we need for Dank Sharding without actually implementing the sharding part. This is a way to make progress towards full Dank Sharding without actually having to do all the complicated things at the same time. The awesome part is... Oh, real quick, I do want to um, touch on Arbitrum and Optimism too at the end of this, so we're going to look at their market caps. I forgot about that. That implementing proto dank sharding will still reduce the transaction fees on layer two networks by an order of magnitude. So how is this actually possible? EIP 4844 adds a new type of persistent memory called a blob to the Ethereum network. As we mentioned before, the current type of persistent Ethereum data, which is called call data, is expensive because it's stored on every single node and that's stored forever. This new type of memory would have an expiration date where it would automatically be deleted. The exact expiration date hasn't exactly been decided, but it would probably be anywhere between 30 days to a few months. The other unique thing about this data is that unlike call data, it would not be available in the EVM. Instead, it would only exist on nodes in the consensus layer instead of the execution layer. In plain English, this means that if you wanted to write an on-chain Ethereum program in a smart contract that uses data from within a specific blob, you would not be able to, at least not directly. In order to handle these blobs of data, EIP 4844 is introducing a new transaction type called a blob carrying transaction. On-chain, these blob carrying transactions will have a hash of a KZG commitment which is an identifier to the blob. We'll get more into those later. This transaction passes through Ethereum consensus just like a normal transaction, except that it has a sidecar with a blob data attached. So basically, whenever an Ethereum node sees one of these blob carrying transactions, it knows that it will have to do some extra work with the blob that's attached to the transaction. Just like call data, right now these blobs will still be stored on every single node. This data storage still takes up resources, so it needs to be paid for somehow. But this blob data doesn't necessarily fit into the current Ethereum fee market. This is why EIP 4 844 introduces a new multi-dimensional fee market. Basically, in addition to the current fee market, there will be a new fee market specifically for these data blobs. This additional fee market will still follow the same structure used with EIP 1559. The fees for storing these blobs is charged in gas, but the actual gas price will adjust up and down to target a certain number of blobs per block. So right now we have one fee market for on-chain data and execution, and after this EIP, we'll have two fee markets, which includes the additional off-chain blob data. But this is the first step and this AIP sets the stage for potentially more fee markets in the future. Before, I mentioned that these blob transactions carry something called a KZG commitment. Actually, they're carrying a hash of a KZG commitment. But if you're not familiar with KZG commitments themselves, they can be thought of as... Thank you for your patience. I know this is boring for some, but the good stuff is coming. We're going to look at Arbitrum and Optimism next. It's a hash of the blob data. Talking about KZG commitments can start to get a little bit complicated. But the important thing to note is that we don't actually need to use a KZG commitment for this upgrade. We could just use a normal data hash, but we will need to use KZG commitments when we implement dank sharding in the future. This is why EIP 4844 is using a KZG commitment instead of something simpler. One interesting quirk about KZG commitments is that they require something called a trusted set up ceremony. Basically, because of all the complex cryptography stuff that's going on under the hood, we need to create a master lock and then throw away the key. This will be done in a public and communal process before EIP 4844 is launched. And it's likely that anybody will be able to participate through the browser. The security of these KZG commitments is dependent on at least one participant in the ceremony to be honest. Because the ceremony will be open to the public, it means that you can be the one honest actor that holds on security for the entire Ethereum network. Once EIP 4844 
4844 is implemented and transaction fees fall by an order of magnitude, a lot more applications will be enabled. Blockchain gaming, blockchain social networks, and even transaction fees in more economically disadvantaged countries will all start to become more possible. It will be a huge step on the path to 1 billion users. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. EIP 4844 is the All right, that's, that's it for that. Again, I just wanted you guys to understand this concept. I do want to go down here. So I want to look down this list because you need to understand where some of these layer twos are right now for size. Um, and let me just find one. Optimism here is a $3.7 billion layer two solution. So I want to point this out because this right here, if it became the size of Solana <clears throat> alone, you're looking at 15x. Now, that's in it, Solana in its current state. I told you Solana could go 15x. So the ability for optimism to go a lot higher, they do have a higher issuance rate. There's a bunch of stuff with them. I'll probably go into that in more detail based upon a lot of good analytics from my buddy James with Invest Answers. He's brilliant. He's got a great Patreon if you guys are willing to pay for something like that. But that's huge too. Now, Arbitrum is another layer two solution. It is at 2.62. So again, I'm talking 15 to 20 X's just if these things become the size of Solana, but Solana could go 15 X. So you could maybe, I could speculate pretty easily, I think, that these can go 30 to 50 X. If this EIP 4844 does really well, if the deflationary environment in Ethereum is really positive, if the narrative becomes more positive behind Ethereum, if the Bitcoin ETFs start to take off, 30 to 40x. Those are great numbers, guys. So I just want to be clear that I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. I'm probably going to try and stack, I don't know, maybe 20 grand on Optimism and Arbitrum too, uh, just, just to see if I can benefit from some of that if I'm right. Not, a, might not be. But for a 30 to 40x potential, maybe even higher, um, I'm willing to place that bet. Anyway, I love you guys. Uh, just trying to get as much information out there and quality out to you as I can. I think this is a great narrative for why Ethereum is just a fascinating investment and why it has some great potential ahead of it and why I think everyone should own a little bit of it. So if you like this content, it's awesome. If you like subscribe, ring that bell so that you get these when they come out. And, uh, and if you, if you join too and spend at least $3, you help support my work and allow me to do more of this in the future. And so hopefully it should be a little more snazzier. Maybe I can start to get a team or something that helps me with analytics and coming up with topics and just prep work. Um, or at least, you know, editing and better stuff to where you're not getting, you know, me just going all the way through it and making mistakes. So any support you have is great. And uh, also, if you do join, um, it's like I said, $3 a month. <clears throat> Biggest benefit really is just, and this applies pretty much to all tiers, is just the ability for you to be able to um, chat with me and ask for like charts and stuff in the daily market recap. So try to do that Monday through Friday at about 3 o'clock, right after the market closes. We hit macro and economic stuff and news for the day that's important and we should be thinking about. <clears throat> and just really try and get the high-end perspective of everything. And then we drop down into charting and looking up, you know, the stuff I commonly track and also requests from people where I will pull up the chart, ask questions about it, do some research real quick, maybe pull up the fundamentals and financials on it too and get a better understanding of it. And what we do as a collective, we try to work together to see if we can find some of the best investment opportunities out there and hash through them in real time. So I think that's beneficial too. So if you're up for it, you can do that. If you're on iOS though, everybody always goes, I don't see where I can join. <sighs> Apple is weird. <clears throat> they don't make it easy to join on YouTube. You have to click these two little A's and request desktop on the screen or just go to a desktop computer and do it. It's way easier that way. Anyway, that's it for this. Uh, I was going to say this weekend, but I guess it's Monday, but it's a holiday, whatever. That's it for today. Love you guys. Hope you get benefit from this and uh, let's do it again. See ya. Bye.